Um, so welcome to everybody um, to today's presentation on positive and productive meetings. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the process that we use for meetings and share some of the learning that we've had um, in the time that we've been using the positive and productive meetings process. Most of us will have spent some of our time in one type of meeting or another and will have had various experiences. Some meetings might look a little bit like this, so where some people talk over one another, you might have somebody who dominates conversation. Because of this, some people might disengage. I've even seen somebody nod off in a meeting. Some wonder why they're there and what they should be doing. There may even be conflict. And what I've seen increasingly over time is people multitasking at meetings. So you might get somebody answering emails on the phone or on the laptop. All of these, I kind of think, constitute not the greatest uh, environment for a meeting. Every team or group of people coming together in a meeting has different struggles. But certain themes seem to consistently emerge. So people often say they don't feel listened to that agendas are over full, meetings might feel boring or lack purpose, um, they can end and no one knows what to do. Or at the opposite side of the spectrum, um, we might attend meetings where everybody feels really clear about the purpose and outcomes for each meeting, where people work together and have just a shared vision and direction. Everyone feels valued for the contribution, regardless of hierarchy or position within the organization. People are able to think for themselves beautifully. We share responsibility um, for what's happening within the meeting and after the meeting. And we work towards people's strengths. So for me, that's great, um, great meetings. But your meetings might be somewhere in the middle. And, and certainly, um, very few people would be go to really disastrous ones or really, really amazing ones. Um, most meetings have something that they could improve on. When we first started to develop uh, the positive productive meetings process, we wanted to create a collaborative process which was respectful and supported people to develop an environment that enabled them to think clearly and therefore perform at their best. We were inspired by the work of a woman called Nancy Klein, who in her book, A Time to Think, talked about creating a thinking environment and stated that there were 10 components to this. Now you can see these on the screen. I'm just going to talk through them. So Nancy said that um, we needed to pay good attention, to pay in attention, so that we were listening with respect, interest, and fascination. And um, I always thought that I was really good at that. And then I really took a look at myself and realized that there were some things that I was doing that kind of contradicted my, uh, my assumption. So I might doodle. I might um, drift off and think about other things. Um, I had the annoying habit of interrupting because I was so excited and couldn't wait to get my, my bit in. And every now and then, I'd finish off someone's sentence. Now, all of these, when I really looked at them, weren't um, examples of great attention. They were quite the opposite. Now, she also said that we need to use incisive questions. So we need to use the type of questions that remove assumptions that limit some of our ideas. We also need to pay attention to equality so that everybody within the meeting, regardless of uh, the hierarchy or pay scale, feels that they're being treated as a thinking peer. So we give equal turns and attention. Uh, we keep to meeting agreements and boundaries as well. We also need to pay attention to appreciation. And um, research tells us that we are more productive if we practice a ratio of 5 to 1 appreciation to criticism. So how do we build that into our meetings as well? We need to create an environment and a structure that offers freedom from rush or urgency. So creating a sense of ease is also really important. We need to think about encouragement. So in many meetings, we might feel under pressure to come up with the best idea. That's not always going to give us the best idea. So we need to think about how we can move beyond competition and work together collaboratively, building on one another's ideas. 
The next bit is sometimes a little bit controversial. So um, what Nancy says is we need to be really mindful of people's feelings within meetings. Um, and we need to allow sufficient emotional release to restore thinking. And again, when I really thought about this, um, it took me back to some times when I felt either really angry or quite upset during meetings. And many of us are quite passionate and the emotions get to us in, in that kind of environment. However, what happens if I'm feeling really angry or I'm feeling really uh, upset is that I focus on not showing that, which means that even though I'm still in the room, I actively am out of the meeting. So if we're in a meeting where there are feelings, uh, we need to figure out how do we allow that emotional release so that we can return um, properly to the meeting. All meetings need to have uh, good information and full information. So we need to provide a full and accurate picture of reality if we're going to be making good decisions. We need to be mindful of place and think about how we create a physical environment that says that everybody in the meeting matters. And the final uh, component of the thinking environment is around diversity. Uh, so we, we need to pay attention to the differences between us and figure out how that adds quality rather than how that might be seen as something that's negative. So in order to ensure that we have good meetings, we need to be clear about what I call the four Ps, purpose, people, process, and progress. So first of all, we need to think about why do we meet and uh, why are we meeting today. We need to think about how do we support one another in our work together and how do we get the best out of one another. We also need to think about who takes responsibility for doing what within meetings. When we think about the process, we need to be clear about what that is, how have we agreed to work, um, how do we make decisions together, how do we share actions and information from our meetings as well. And then the final P is how do we review our progress and what else can we try when we've been using positive and productive meetings. So let's start by thinking about purpose. Why do we meet? So we need to be clear about the big picture purpose of the meeting. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than being sent to a meeting where you don't really know what's expected of you within that or what the purpose of it is. Uh, and we need to have a, to feel prepared with an agenda and to understand what the desired outcomes are from that as well. So here are some examples of how you might capture this information on a page or on a meeting map. And if you've attended any of our training with Helen Sanderson Associates, um, what you will have seen is a meeting map that might look a bit like this with a section for the purpose, uh, a section for writing out the main points of the agenda, uh, a section that shows, shows what roles people are taking, and a section that shows what meeting arrangements we have, so what ground rules we have as well. Here are some other examples of how other people have created some meeting maps. This one, as you can see, is really visual. And what I like about this is that uh, people said that there's no such thing as a silly question is the only rule that they wanted to stick to within this one. This one is where an organization were looking at staff recruitment and uh, captured that in a real pictorial way. This meeting map. Um, was for a work group looking at an organization um, and how they used person-centered thinking tools. And as you can see, there's a really creative graphic on this one. This is where um, educational services developed a meeting map for planning the uh, school year ahead. And here's one about hiring and retaining quality staff. As you can see, they're all different, and there's no one way to develop a meeting map. But if you're really visual, um, then this might be something that you would do. However, what you might want within your type of meeting is something that looks more formal. But again, uh, as long as we've got those key components, the purpose, the agenda, and the, the ground rules, 
And I would also suggest the, um, the roles then I think we've got a really good outline of uh, what, what to expect from the meeting. Just before I move on, I want to just mention that we are going to have uh, an opportunity for questions at the end of the meeting. And um, we're going to use the questions box for that. So if you have anything, I kind of suggest that you write it down as we go along. And then when I finish the presentation, I'll uh, look through the questions and answer anything that comes up. So I hope that's helpful. This is, a, this is an example of um, the more detailed meeting agenda. So if we're using the positive and productive meetings process, then we would be having a more detailed agenda prior to the meeting. The meeting map would be something that we use on the day. And within the meeting agenda, you can see that there are different columns there. First column is about being clear about what the question is or the issue. And um, we would generally phrase that as a question. The next section um, has who owns the agenda item. So that's the person who wants to put it on. We then figure out, is it an informational item, something that we're just going to share with others? Or is it an item that requires discussion and a decision? And knowing that will help determine how much time we um, allot to that and whether we use any um, thinking time within the meeting to, to explore it. If it's information, then we probably don't need to explore it at this point. The next column is about thinking about uh, what the outcome of having the agenda on, on the, um, sorry, the agenda question on there is. So we need to be clear about um, what we hope to achieve by putting it on the agenda in the first place. The next one is to give us um, good information about how we prepare for that agenda question. So we might need to bring our diaries or have read a paper, etc. And the final section is about how much time are we allotting to the meeting. So if we're really clear about that, we're less likely to overfill the agenda and rush. A good tip when we're developing the agenda is to think about how can we use person-centered thinking tools to help us explore the agenda item, or how might we use thinking rounds or time talk as well. And making a note at the side of the agenda uh, is a good way of reminding us that that's a great way of embedding person-centered thinking within that as well. So the, the second P is people. And in order to figure out how to support one another in our work together, um, we would create meeting arrangements, such as ground rules. And in doing this, we're clarifying and agreeing to creating conditions that get the best out of one another. We would also be figuring out who's going to do what by creating meeting roles. Um, when my provider, my old provider organization, first started to look at meeting roles, um, we had worked in quite a traditional way. So as a manager, my responsibility had been to um, to uh, facilitate the meeting, to develop the agenda for the meeting, to coordinate the meeting. If we were going to have any kind of tea or biscuits, I'd be sorting that out. And I probably would end up doing the minutes as well, which is an awful lot of responsibility for one person. One of the principles of positive reductive meetings is sharing responsibility so everybody feels that they own the meeting in one way or another. So we think about. Um, Creating, uh, creating roles for different people within in the meeting. It's really important that when we're doing this, we think about roles as a way of matching existing gifts and skills or stretching potential. When my provider organization first did this, um, we looked at it in a bit more of a tongue-in-cheek way. And Tony, who was one of our senior managers, was allocated the timekeeper role. That wasn't because he was great at time. That was because he was somebody who was often late, didn't own a watch, and we, in a kind of jokey kind of way, thought that that would help fix him. It didn't. It just meant that we weren't using his skills really well. So we wouldn't use roles punitively. It's a good tip. Uh, we need to match to gift skills and potential. 
So we start by establishing ground rules so that everybody is clear about what to expect from one another and about creating conditions where we, um, we get the best out of our time together. So there are certain roles that uh, are really essential within a meeting. The role of the facilitator is really important, um, but that's a role that can be done by anybody who's good at helping people work through an agenda and some who's good at making sure that the time's spent efficiently and effectively. That doesn't have to be the most senior person within the meeting. Another role is the agenda developer, and their role is to ensure that they've received the agenda, that everybody receives the agenda before the meeting, that uh, agenda items for discussion are prepared, and that everybody knows what the outcome uh, is of the agenda item, who owns it, how much time do we need for it as well. Good meetings have somebody who's thinking about and paying attention to hospitality. What we want people to do is feel that they matter and that they are a valued contributor. So the hospitality person would prepare the meeting room to be welcome and comfortable, making sure that, that it's warm enough, that the lighting's uh, fine, that we've got enough chairs. Um, but also what you might want is food and drinks as well. And each team would figure out what does that look like to them. In um, one of the teams that I've worked in, we had morning meetings and we really enjoyed having tea and toast uh, and were welcomed into Bob Marley in the morning. It's also important that we keep an eye on the time. So we need a timekeeper. And again, that person's responsibility is to start and finish on time, to ensure that we begin sessions after breaks on time, and to remind the facilitator how much time we have for each agenda item so that we don't run over. We also would have a rounds leader. So a thinking round uh, is a way of everybody being heard. And the rounds leader would spot where a round is needed, facilitate this, and they would de determine the opening and closing round questions. And I'll tell you more about that later. We definitely need somebody to record what happens at the meeting. And depending on what type of meetings you have, they might be minutes that capture people's discussions, or they might be simply actions and decisions. Uh, whatever you do, we need somebody who does that really well. And for some meetings, we might want somebody who captures things in a, a, a visual way. So we might want a graphic recorder as well. Another role. Uh, to use would be somebody who pay, is paying attention to the meeting process and helping us uh, stay on track and make sure that we follow what we, we've agreed. But they would also pay attention to the ground rules that we've agreed as well and might gently pull us back when we go off track. So their responsibility is to remind us about sticking to meeting agreements and the ways of running the meeting. So the next P is process. And in this section, uh, we think about clarifying what our meeting process is, how we make decisions, and how we action and, inf uh, and share information from our meetings. This is the meeting process um, in a graphic way that you can have a look at. And as you can see, it starts before the meeting with the agenda development. Once at the meeting, again, it starts before the meeting when we think about creating a welcoming environment. So as a team, what does that look like for you? How are we going to let people know that they matter? We then would start with an opening positive round. And here, what I would usually ask people is to share something that they're pleased and proud of or something that's gone well from work and home. Now, hearing about work is absolutely essential because that gives us some good information that might influence some of our decisions later on in the day. The reason I would ask about home is that it's really helpful to know what matters to people on a personal as well as a work level. We get to know each other on a deeper level, and it really contributes to building person-centered teams. The next thing we would do was just check out the meeting map, make sure that we're all clear about why we're there and we would clarify the agenda and the timings for the day. What's really helpful then is if we separate out 
the um, agenda into items for information, which usually take less time, and then items that require a bit more time and thinking uh, for discussion and decision. And as I said earlier, they would be phrased as questions so that that invites discussion, helps people prepare before the meeting. At the end of the meeting, we would review our actions, make sure we've all heard the same thing and we've recorded that. And we would check out, has anything arisen during the meeting that's a burning issue? Um, and we would figure out, does that go on the next agenda item, uh, on, uh, meeting, or is that something that people need to action following the meeting? We would end the meeting by doing a, a closing round, and we would ask in this closing round, what have we most appreciated about our time together today? This really helps to close down the meeting in a positive way, but again gives really good information about what aspects of the meeting are working for people as well. So as you can see, within the positive and productive meeting process, there's a before, during, ending, and after cycle. So before we're thinking about what's the purpose, is the meeting necessary? Who needs to participate? What's the agenda? And how do we prepare? During, we're paying good attention to the opening round where we're getting uh, good information. We're reviewing the roles, rules, and the agenda. We're recording the actions, issues, and decisions, and we're checking out that the process is working for us. We end by clarifying who's going to do by what, and we evaluate the meeting. And then afterwards, we communicate the outcomes, we implement the actions, we follow up on progress, and we plan the next meeting if there's to be one. I mentioned before a couple of meeting techniques within that, and one of them was the thinking round. So the thinking round is um, probably one of the most significant tools that we can use within uh, a meeting. And no single technique, for me, more fully expresses the importance of listening to each other in meetings and rounds. Um, a, a thinking round saves time, energy, and in many circumstances, hurt feelings. A round is an uninterrupted go around the group based on the agenda question. During the round, each person pays close attention to the person speaking and listens thoughtfully without interruption to everyone's contribution. This really ensures that we all get the opportunity to build on each other's thinking and that everybody has the opportunity to contribute. Even the quieter people who might not always get a word in otherwise get an opportunity to, to share here. The round also sets out the expectation that if you're at a meeting, there's an expectation that you do contribute. One of my pet annoyances is the passive attendee, people who like to turn up but don't make any contributions. I was using um, thinking rounds with a team uh, a couple of years ago who had um, been having meetings but not having meetings that they felt were successful. The meetings weren't frequent. They didn't really have a set agenda. And when people turned up to them, they used it as an opportunity to offload what wasn't going well. And the more dominant people in the meeting get to have the most of the say. So I started to introduce thinking rounds. And I noticed that one of the youngest members of the group, a young man called Kieran, um, hadn't said anything at all during the process until it got to the thinking round. Surprisingly, when it got to his turn, he actually, he actually had loads and loads to say. And as the meeting went on, his contribution increased and increased. After the meeting, he pulled me to one side and said that he'd never really been able to get a word in edgeways and hadn't felt confident getting into the meeting because of some of the more dominant characters. So it felt really important for him to be able to have time that was carved out just for him. So the thinking round is a really good foundation for ensuring that we listen to one another and that regardless of personality or hierarchy, everybody uh, gets a chance to speak. Another technique that you might use is time talk. And in time talk, what we would do is split people into thinking pairs each person within the thinking pairs is given a question, and they have three minutes each to talk through that question. The, the thinking partner listens really well. They give good attention. They don't interrupt. 
and even if that person uh, who is talking doesn't talk for the full three minutes, we still stay quiet for those three minutes. Once that, once that three minutes is up, we swap thinking partners and we uh, go through that process again. At the end of those three minutes, we share our freshest thinking. And I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes the first thing I say isn't always my best thinking. So time talk really helps me get to uh, my best thinking. It also really helps for people who aren't at the best within a big group, really ensures that they get to contribute in a way that makes sense to them as well. So the next P is progress. And we need to think about how do we review how we're doing with our meetings, are we evaluating them, how are we planning for next steps, and is there anything else that we could be trying to get the best out of our time together. Here are some ways that other organizations have thought about evaluating their meetings. Um, I really like this one. This shows how you can use continuums to check out how you're progressing with your meetings. So have we achieved our, achieved our desired outcomes? Have we followed the agenda? Were we comfortable? And every con everybody who contributed and was heard is a great way to measure progress and success. Here's another one where um, an organization has evaluated how successful meetings are uh, by using two different questionnaires. And again, they're really useful in checking out how we're doing. You might use the four plus one questions to determine next steps within your meetings. And it's really helpful if we build into uh, long-standing meetings an opportunity to evaluate how we're doing so we can do some fine tuning. So we might be asking the questions, what have we tried? What have we learned? What are we pleased about? What are we concerned about? And given that information, what are we going to do next to ensure we get the best out of our time together? So the latest thinking that we've been doing with some people is helping them with online evaluation. So they've been filling in a survey monkey before they start using the positive and productive meeting process. And then once they've been using it after about six months, they come back and they fill that in again. And they then have hard data on what's improved within their meetings by using this process. So I hope that this has been a useful walkthrough of positive and productive meetings. Although it focuses on very human elements, after all, it's the people who make the meeting, it really is a solid professional tool that delivers measurable results. People, after they've been using this process, come to the meetings prepared, the meetings run more smoothly, things get done, everybody leaves the meetings with clear tasks and timelines. I have to say, uh, in my experience, meetings just get better. So there you have it. That's the end of the presentation. And now I'd like to invite you to ask any questions using your questions box. Okay, Kerry, can you hear me? I um, can't see the questions box, I'm afraid. So I need to um, ask you for a little bit of help here. Okay, I've just unmuted myself. Hi, everybody. Um, okay, um, I can see the questions, Michelle. So would you rather I read them out and then you answer them? That would be lovely. I don't know why they've disappeared off my screen. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, a comment from Joe, which says, thank you very much for this. Nancy Klein's listening skills provide food for thought, and thanks for sharing how you demonstrate, or not, in brackets, attention. I really liked the meeting map. Thank you. That Great comment, Joe. Uh, and then Mary has put um, hi, and uh, it says, you mentioned 5-1 appreciation to criticism. Could you expand, please? 
Yeah, um, research tells us that we are more productive if we uh, have a 5 to 1 ratio of appreciation to criticism. So for every um, constructive criticism, something we could do different, we need to have five things that we're doing well. And when I first started thinking about this, I thought about not just how we structured our meetings around developing a culture of appreciation, but how I supervise staff. And I went back to my supervision and thought, am I creating conditions where people feel really valued and appreciated, as well as checking on performance? But I also went back and thought about, with my family, am I using five to one appreciation to criticism? And I started by thinking about um, people getting up in the morning. This is when my children were much younger. And I kind of analyzed my um, opening conversations with my children. And I was starting by saying, will you hurry up and get dressed, please? Have you got your books packed? Will you eat with your mouth closed? Will you use your knife and fork properly? Things like that, which makes me sound really bad. But it really made me think about, actually, would, would my kids have responded better to focusing on what they were doing well rather than focusing on what I wanted them to do differently? Um, so th there is research on that, but I suppose I hope that answers your question. Anything okay. else, Kerry? Next one is uh, yes. from Joe again. Uh, Joe has put, sorry, may have missed this. Do you time thinking rounds? That's a really, really good point, and uh, it depends on the structure of your agenda. It depends on how much time you've given the agenda item, but it also depends on how many people you've got in. So what has been helpful in the past is to say, okay, we're going to give each people no more than two minutes to share their, their thinking on this. But again, it all depends on how much time you've given to the agenda item. Okay. Any other questions? Um, final question is from Nikki. And, it, and Nikki asks, how do you deal with people who want to sabotage the meeting? Oh, <laughs> good question. I, I think if we um, start at the beginning and we figure out if we've got the right people at the meeting, that's the first thing. But sometimes we have to have people at the meeting. So if it's a team meeting, we want everybody to attend. But I think the, the beauty of developing shared ground rules is where everybody contributes to that. And we all monitor that and police it. So even though you might have some use responsibility as it is for ground rules, it's everybody's responsibility to check out whether we're working towards that. And I think if people are deliberately sabotaging meetings, the first thing we would do is remind them of the ground rules. But then if it became more frequent, we would do what we would do in any other situations, and we would figure out what was going wrong for them. Any other questions? That's all the questions I have at the moment. OK. Lovely. So um, I hope that was helpful for you. And the presentation is going to go on um, a Dropbox folder that Kerry's going to create around the webinars. And it's also going to go on the website with the recording as well. I hope it was useful for you. And um, thank you very much.